as you, if you will, please remain standing for the reading of the gospel. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you're the Son of God, come command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will be all yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you're the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you. And on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. And you may be seated. Sunday. It's the first Sunday of the month. Uh, our communion offering today, uh, I don't know if I have it listed on there, it goes to, uh, i got to think, one great hour of sharing. So as you, the offering is in the back, we won't be passing the offering plate yet, we're not back to that, but the offering is in the basket in the back, and any spare change you have, nickels, dimes, quarters, pennies, anything like that, uh, of course we'll also take ones, hundreds, Ten thousand dollar bills, whatever. <laughs> uh, those go up here, and those go to our communion offering. In the United Methodist Church, when we serve communion at the Holy Table, all are invited to come. The only requirement we have is that you answer this invitation. Christ our Lord invites to His table all that love Him. 
who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. God longs for honesty in us. Even though our culture seems to avoid talk of sin and confession, our relationship with God cannot flourish unless we freely and honestly express all the facets of our lives, our hopes, fears, sins, desires, thanksgiving, and praise. Together. Gracious, Gracious God, God, our, our sins, sins are too heavy to carry, too, too real to hide, and, and too, too deep to undo. undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our, what our hearts can no longer bear, and, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past we cannot change. Open to us a future in which we can be changed, and grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image. Amen. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied, for every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ, I live. Well, friends, our scripture today for the message comes from Deuteronomy. You may or you probably don't know, but I, I well, I am, you do know probably. I'm a lectionary preacher, so I go by the Revised Common Lectionary. You don't know what that means. Uh, there's a bunch of people that have gotten together and they set out scriptures. There's one for every single week. There's an Old Testament, New Testament, uh, a gospel, and a psalm. And I mark in my Bible what I preached on three years ago when we were in the same cycle, and I did not preach on Deuteronomy. So we're going to hear about it today. I try to be fresh in these words, and I know for sure that every time I read these scriptures, they mean something different to me. So hear the word of God from Deuteronomy in the 26th chapter, beginning with verse 1. When you have come into the land that the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance to possess, and you possess it, and settle in it, you'll take some of the first of all the fruit of the ground, which you harvest from the land that the Lord your God has given you, and shall put it in a basket, and go to the place that the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name. You go to the priest who is in office at that time and say to him, Today I declare to the Lord your God that I have come into the land that the Lord swore to our ancestors to give us. When the priest takes the basket from your hand and sets it down before the altar of the Lord your God, you shall make this response before the Lord your God. A wandering Aramean was my ancestor. He went down into Egypt and lived there as an alien. Few in number, and there he became a great nation, mighty and populous. When the Egyptians treated us harshly and afflicted us by imposing hard labor on us, we cried to the Lord, the God of our ancestors. The Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil, and our oppression. The Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm with a terrifying display of power and with signs and wonders. And he brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So now I bring the first of the fruit of the ground that you, O Lord, have given me. You shall set it down before the Lord your God and bow down before the Lord your God. Then you together with the Levites and the aliens who reside among you shall celebrate with all the bounty that the Lord your God has given you and to your house. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. God. Amen. Well, so the message here, I think, is appropriate for Lent. I think it's appropriate for us right now. It's appropriate for us in this time where we live. Do some of these words sound sort of, of uh, uh, familiar, where you've been harshly afflicted by imposing hard labor on us? Well, most of us don't have that, but we certainly have had some trials and tribulations in recent days, have we not? I mean, we've been through this thing we call COVID. We, we, we think it's nearing the end, but we've still been through it. We've been through it all together. Our lives have been forever changed. And so we've had to figure out how to navigate through that. But it seems to me that before we can really appreciate where we are in this life, we need to stop for a few minutes and celebrate what God has given us. 
Now, we didn't get brought out of Egypt, but we certainly have been brought out of a lot of things in our lives. And if we go around this room today, we could probably all talk a lot about the blessings that we have, the lives we have, compared to the way it was. That, well, as I heard somebody talking about the golden years, how about the good old golden days? My grandmother, Brian, grew up in, or lived in Cedar of Texas. Uh, we went back to see her at least once a month. I talk about this, it's almost hard to even believe that it's true, but when they built her house, they built a frame, just like they do now when you see them building a house, they build a wood frame. They put one rough cedar board on the outside of the frame. There was no insulation. I thought it was the coolest house ever because those boards that were, the, that were holding the, the studs together to keep her from Change it with those were the shelves in her house where she sat the radio or she said other stuff. I thought it was the coolest house ever. She had shelves all over the whole house. <laughs> One electrical light, which was added way years later, coming down in the center of every room. And if she had a radio and a fan, she never had air conditioning. There was a wire coming out of those going to wherever they went. You had to, well, I'm short. I didn't have to duck much, but other people would have had to. The little bathroom was kind of inconvenient because it wasn't there when they built the house. They just kind of tacked it on. So when I say we need to be thankful for the things we have, do all of y'all have indoor plumbing? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty sure, even though Brenda lied to me and told me she walked, I'm pretty sure nobody had to walk here today. <laughs> I'm picking on you, Brenda. You, she came in the door and said, I walked to church today. I said, no, no, no. <laughs> Nobody had to walk, did they? In fact, the chances are we even rode in a car that had air conditioning and maybe a radio. Hey, my first car had no radio and no air conditioning. Well, unless you were doing 60 and then you had four times 60 air conditioning, you opened all the windows. You know, I, I, but I, I think sometimes we look around at the lives we live and we gripe, don't we, about stuff? We complain about what's going on. We need to take time. This is Lent. This is a time when we're supposed to reflect, remember, and repent. And maybe one of the things we can begin repenting about is griping about the lit situation we're in today. Because I want to tell you, it's better than 99% of the rest of the people in the world. And we need to put that into perspective. And we need to take time and celebrate what God has given us because on my own, I couldn't accomplish any of it. But God provides. God continues to provide. And God has provided great blessings on the, 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 the city of Pasadena, Deer Park, LaPorte, this part of Harris County. Great blessings. Great blessings on this great state of Texas. Or I guess we should say the most wonderful, great state of Texas. Which today is Alamo Day, by the day, by the way. And on March the 6th, our, our friends that protected us and helped us become a country at that time gave their lives at the Alamo today. And if they were here today, they'd look around and say, you guys have it a little better than we did. Amen. And I think sometimes we think that in, in, in such narrow terms that we look at just where we are and we look and say, oh my gosh, things are just horrible. Well, let me just tell you, friends, as bad as they get, they're better than they could be. And it just seems to me that we need to, you know, sometimes it's useful to go back into this time of Deuteronomy where these people, they had left slavery in Egypt. They were given the land, the land flowing with milk and honey. Don't we live in a land like that? And they were given this land filled with what they called milk and honey where they could prosper and they could do stuff. And the, the, the commandment from the temple was when you do the first fruits, go back to God. It took me a long time to learn that lesson. A long time. To realize that every blessing I had, God got the credit first. To put my situation and requirements that God puts on me first before I put the other things in order. And you know what I found out? The other things line up better when you do that. And I'm not just talking about giving. I'm talking about service and, and response and living a Christian life other than for two hours a week when you're in church. 
How do we do that? How do we, what, what are those? If we really are that blessed, then we would should all, almost all, quote my friend Harry Jenkins, who says every time you meet him, this is the best day of my life. Isn't it? Amen. It really is. And I think we need to, to, to carefully approach our way that we move into the wilderness, if you will, and not do it with a sour look on our face. One of the things we say on Ash Wednesday is, is from the scriptures. It says, you know, don't, don't fast and pray and go around with a sour look on your face. Anoint yourself with oil. Have a glowing complexion. Go out into the world and fast in private. Don't be one of those people that, you know, they love to make sure everybody sees what they've done for God. Just do the stuff. You know, we celebrate all those great founders of the faith and those great founders of our country. But you know what? There was so much done by people we never knew their names. People on occasion talk to me about John Wesley. John Wesley wouldn't have been what John Wesley was if he hadn't had a dad that was the dad he was and wouldn't have had a mom that was persistent about educating their children. And we have it great. Our kids have an opportunity to go to school. They have an opportunity to do stuff. But friends, we need to realize that we can't go back and do it like they did it in Deuteronomy. In fact, we can't even do it like we did it when I was 11 or 12 because we're in a situation now where people are more exposed to stuff. They see stuff. They have much more exposure in their lives. And so many times in our lives, we have told the children of our lives we're providing for you, learn it the way we tell you, instead of asking how they learn and doing it the way they learn best. Church is kind of like that too. I mean, for years and years, the church was, in Methodist churches, was 1050 on Sunday, and you showed up and you did the same stuff, and you sang this pretty much the same hymns, and you had a responsive reading, you had a three-point and a poem sermon from the preacher, and you went home. Well, I can tell you that still works for people that are products of the 40s and 50s. It doesn't work for those people that are products of the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s. You'll recall last week, if you were here, I mentioned about having a mountaintop experience. If I were to ask you about that now, would I, if I were to say, have you ever had a mountaintop experience, would you be able to answer that? Most of us have had one. You know what I'm talking about, but a young lady that was in church came up to me afterward and she said, what is a mountaintop experience? And I said, well, you know, Peter, James, and Paul were up there on the mountain with Jesus and, and, and great things happened. God appeared and that was a big deal. And so we take that kind of an experience and say, well, have you ever had a mountaintop experience in your life? And for many of us, we have. We graduated from high school. That was a big celebration. We went, got out or got into or out of the military service. Either of those, either one of those could be a mountaintop experience. Uh, you know, we came home from Vietnam and saw our family. That's a mountaintop experience. Uh, we got our first new car. That was, you know, my, anyway, so I asked her, I said, well, didn't your dad give you a new car when you turned 16? She said, yeah. I said, well, let me tell you, that's a mountaintop experience. Because my dad co-signed a note so I could buy a used car. <laughs> and for me, that was a mountaintop experience. But it never dawned on me that a phrase that I use so often or think about so readily or, or just can immediately identify with being on the top of a mountain and, you know, Pikes Peak or, or something like that, somebody younger might not understand it. Friends, we've got to understand the people we need to reach don't necessarily speak the language we speak. Amen. So it's great to have celebrations. And it's great to do stuff, but things that we do, like what we did the other day, where we invite people to come in here and find out that we're kind of normal and do stuff, those are really important too. I was at, uh, I don't know where I was, somewhere in the last couple of days, and a person came up to me and said, I've got to talk to you for a minute. And I said, okay. It was not a person that's connected to our church. And they, they said, you know, I don't think. If it was, y'all remind me later. Uh, but they said, you know, I ran into somebody that knew somebody that knew somebody that knew some, there was a, a, a special ed teacher up here at Golden Acres Elementary. 
And she said something about the way that church, that Hope Community Methodist Church, had taken the kids and told them stories. She said, not one person left without something in their hand. She said, the difference that church makes in this community is so big, nobody else can top that. Hmm. And all we're doing is giving away a 75 cent pumpkin and telling some stories, and hanging out with kids. So often we look at the children of our world and we see our future, but we don't put ourselves down to their level and see what they see. I was telling stories about that last night, and I can't tell some of them, or I'm not going to tell some of them here, but so many times in our lives the kids say stuff. We hear kids somewhere acting in a way, and they say stuff, and it's disrespectful, and we wonder where they get that. And we assume they get it from their buddies, but you know what? Sometimes they get it from their parents. Amen. And so there's, a, there's an opportunity for us to be role models and grandparents and even uh, pseudo-parents for children that are out in the world when we see them doing stuff frequently. I, I used to catch them all the time out here playing uh, in, in the courtyard between these two buildings playing with their football. And I told them, I said, we got a whole field across the street. Go over there. You won't break any windows. But I wasn't mean to them. I didn't yell at them. It just irks me every time I drive past a particular Methodist church that says on the, on the, on the uh, marquee, it says, open doors, open hearts, ever open minds. Remember that? That used to be our mantra. And then right next to it, it says, no loitering, no skateboarding, private property, stay off. <laughs> I mean, come on. If you've got a skateboard in this town, in this community, and you want to ride it, where else are you going to find a sidewalk? And it seems to me that if we keep doing it the way we used to do it, we're going to be where we used to be, and that's nowhere. Yep. You can't stay on the mountaintop. You've got to look for the next mountaintop. You've got to look for that next great experience. Amen. And I'm convinced, I'm absolutely convinced that the world right now is looking. They're seeking. They're searching. They want to know. But it's not going to do any good to grab this up and says, pal, it says to me, your lifestyle is a sin. That's not the way you win people to Christ. Last night I read from Romans. In the book of Romans it says, there's several places it says this, but one of them it says there's no difference in Jew or Gentile or Greek or Jew. There's no difference. Uh, Paul goes on to elaborate that. There's no difference in, in anything. Everybody's the same. You see, God came to save everyone. Amen. And really, I, I'm not sure that wouldn't be the best sermon all <laughs> of all to just stand up and say, folks, remember this. When you leave here today, God's came to save everyone. And then go sit down. The people we don't like, the people we don't like their lifestyle, the people we're angry with, it doesn't make any difference. God came to Jesus Christ, came to this planet to save them too. And the difference between us and them is God has told us, Jesus has said, you go and make disciples. He didn't call the ones that didn't believe in him to go. What he says is, if you, can, if you believe in your heart and confess with your lips, you are saved. And then later on, in a different scripture, in a different place, he says, you go and make disciples. And then he also says, remember that you don't go alone. Lo, I will be with you always until the end of the age. When I joined the police department, I had to stand up and swear an oath. I'm told that that oath still stands, even though I'm no longer working there. It's pretty much like the one you take when you go into the military. When we stood up and told, gave our lives to Jesus Christ, we took an oath. We would support our church with our prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. But more than that, the whole notion of giving your life to Christ means I give whatever I had to you, O oh Lord. Now you use it, and God is calling us to go into the world and make disciples. Not go into the world and read the scripture. Not go into the world and beat them up. Not go into the world and criticize them. Not go into the world and judge them. Go into the world and make disciples. If we don't talk to them, if we don't interact with them, if we set up stanchions around the church so that we never let anybody different in, then we will accomplish absolutely none of what the Great Commandment says. 
And you say, well, I don't, I'm not going to go out and do like those Mormon guys, ride a bike around, wear a tie, and beat on people's doors. I'm not asking that. Jesus isn't asking that. But you live your life. You talk to people. You see people. You talk to people. They ought to know who we might have another him. No, we won't. <laughs> they ought to know that you have the joy of Jesus. That's a him. Yep. They ought to know about that. Even if we're doing Lent where we're repenting and we're realizing what this confession we made, where we, we've not lived up. We've, I love the way this says this. We, for, we ask to be forgiven what our lips tremble to name. What our hearts can no longer bear what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. You think it's bad for us who understand who Christ is. Those people out in the world that only think they know what Christ is, they feel like they are so far down the path they can't get back. And somebody's got to turn a light on and say, come this way. And if we really get, if we really take time to celebrate what God has given us, we are come, we are prepared, we are equipped to do it. And so the question is, what keeps us from doing it? Are we afraid? I mean, I know I was at times in high school, college. I didn't want to be called a Jesus freak, a holy roller, one of those weird people. I wanted to fit in. But I can tell you right now in the world, those people would like to fit in too. They just don't know why. They just don't know what it's about. They, don't, they think they know. They drive by the front of every church in town and they think they know those self-righteous, pompous people are in there and they think they're better than me. Zig Ziglar said one time, I can't do his accent very well, but anyway, they said all the time, said, he said, somebody said to him one time, I'm not going to church, it's full of hypocrites. It is. We are. But it's at least the ones going to church are closer to God than the ones that don't. Amen. Amen. Yeah. <coughs> we are sinners. We fail. We fall short. We are not able to do everything we wish we could do. We look in the mirror and we feel like we have failed God. We haven't lived up to what God has in our potential. And the fact is we haven't. But that doesn't mean we can, don't keep going. Because we don't know when that next thing we do, that next thing we say, that, that next one little thing. I, I, I remember standing in, in Joskies at Gulfgate some many, many, many years ago when it was open and I was little. And my mom and I were walking through the store and, and uh, this lady came up to her and said, are you Miss Womack? She said, yeah, I am. He said, well, my youngest daughter, I think it was, had you for second grade. Oh, what was her name? Well, it was Sally. She said, oh yeah, I remember her. I doubt she did. <laughs> and she said, uh, she said, I just want to tell you what a difference the way you taught Sally or whatever her name was made for the rest of our family. Your mom didn't know. She didn't know the whole family. She didn't know all the brothers and sisters, aunts, uncles, and everybody else. But something happened. And that same thing is going on in your life right now. There are people that you have had an impact or an effect on that you don't even know it. And, and, and when we have that opportunity, we need to do it without an expectation of seeing the results. You know, you hear me say this all the time. When you don't know what to do, be kind. When you don't know how to treat somebody, be kind. But we do have this built-in, uh, I'm not sure about all the right words to, to call it, but in our upbringing, we learn certain things that create in us certain prejudices, if you will. And I got them. I don't know about y'all. And I judge people based on some things about them that are just, I know it's dead wrong. I don't give them a chance to find out who they are. I just see certain things about certain people. I don't want any part of it. And I know it's wrong. And I know I ought to give them a chance. 
but I don't always. Because just like y'all, I'm a work in progress. I'm trying to figure it out. One year we were working in the pumpkin patch. I know Ron remembers this. Car pulled up out of the pumpkin patch, didn't have any doors on it. I don't think it had any doors, did it, Ron? Yeah, it was just missing one. Oh, okay, it was missing eight of them. It's a better story than none, but we'll try to be accurate if we can. And these people piled out of there, and they looked not like any of us, let me just say that. And it was a little off-putting. First of all, they came up without a door, and then secondly, they get out, and then, you know, there's part of us saying, if they can't afford a door, they're probably not going to be buying any pumpkins. You see how this kind of works? But you know what we did? We talked to them anyway, and they were as nice of people as you'd ever run across, in spite of the way they looked or the way they drove up. And we do the same thing in reverse, too. When we watch people coming out here to the food box, the, the blessing box, they drive up, you know, in a, in a really nice car. We think, well, why are they there? And one lady told me when, during the middle of the, of the pandemic, she said, you know, I was an aide up here at one of the Pasadena schools, but when they went to at-home schooling, they didn't need me anymore. They laid me off. My husband was a handy worker, a handy man. He went around and did work for people in their houses. When the pandemic came, nobody wanted him in their house. We're struggling. If it wasn't for this blessing box, we wouldn't have been able to eat. Yeah, they had a nice car. But they had the nice car when they were both employed and doing stuff. Things changed. So there is a time when I think we've got to somehow put our, our shoes, our feet in their shoes and walk with them and see what's going on. At least maybe inquire enough to find out who they are and what's going on in their life. In other words, be kind. I just wonder how many people I could have known better. There may have been a blessing to me in some way or the other that I didn't even make an opportunity. And I wonder how many times that happens for all of us. I mean, I can name some names, but I won't. There are people close to us that live right around in this neighborhood that we started off with a different kind of relationship than we have now. So I think instead of wanting something more than what we have, we ought to just take a break from that and be thankful today for what we have. And then if we really become aware of what we have, we all realize we have something we can give. I'm not talking about money or, or physical things. But if we go back to that Romans passage where we have Jesus in our heart and we confess him with our lips, what would be wrong with doing that where somebody could hear it? What would be wrong with letting somebody know that you have the joy of Jesus? Mm -hmm. And Lent gives us an interesting opportunity for that because we get to go around and, and maybe remind people uh, instead of focusing on the Easter eggs that are already at Walgreens, maybe, you know, when we run into people, say, I hope you have a holy Lent. They might say, what's that? Then you might get to say, well, it's the 40 days, not count Sundays before Easter, when we remember what our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ went through. When we try to remind ourselves that we're not always on the right path, that maybe just like you, I'm a sinner. And there's a place where sinners can go. And they're welcome. It's a place where your past matters not very much at all to us. What matters is where you're going, and we want you to go with us to eternity. Amen. It's really a special time. I'm not big on asking people to give stuff up for Lent, especially nowadays. You don't want people to give up food if they're diabetic. That's a bad thing. So my notion right now is why don't we give up griping for 40 days? 
Maybe give up complaining for 40 days. Most of our wives would love that. Great idea. And all the men would too. <laughs> Maybe we could give up being discouraged for 40 days. Maybe it would even become a habit that we wouldn't always be discouraged in the future. Yeah. Maybe we could take on something. And that's an attitude and a spirit of hope. I don't think I can stand up here today and not say something about the people of Ukraine. There's people in Ukraine who have hope. They're willing to fight, to give up, to sacrifice, because they have the hope, in some ways, of being what we are. Because they've been able to see what we are. Not just us, other European countries too, but freedom. Let me tell you, there's people in Russia seeing it too. Thankfully, there seems to be this amazing unification of NATO and in many ways people in our country around us. That's what people need to see. You know, if you look on our original documents, it says e pluribus unum, right? That's where it says out of many one. That's what we are, friends. We are Americans. We are Christians. That's us out of many one. Yeah, let's don't let everybody see all the backbiting. We can do that at home in our rooms or whatever. Let's get together and be unified around the Spirit of Christ, especially as we get close to Easter, so that on Easter Sunday morning, we can actually all celebrate that the tomb is empty. Amen. And we should let all of our friends know that's a celebration. Yep. We should let everybody know. I'm not saying you need to get one of those little white crosses put in the front yard says he is risen. They shouldn't need to see that to know the joy of Jesus Christ. It should show up in your demeanor and your smile and your hopefulness and the ability you have to face the struggles of this world and move forward into the hope of tomorrow. I believe that we're in for great days. And I believe the church is in for a great revival, although I, I think it's better to call it a Bible, not revival. I'm not sure I like where it was, but I sure like where I see it going. And I think we have a chance to be a part of a movement, much like John Wesley saw back in his time of a grassroots movement of people that love Jesus Christ, beginning to love each other in spite of our differences and move forward for a time when we look for solutions, there are a gazillion things we all agree on. Let's focus on those and leave some of the few we don't agree on on the side. We can make a difference. And even the small number of us here at Hope Community United Methodist Church, we can make a difference because we might be the epicenter of change. Who knows if we don't try? My message today is celebrate what God has given. In a few minutes, I'm going to invite you to the communion table. It's another celebration of what God has given. Jesus, in his last time on this planet, met with the disciples and ate or shared a meal with them like this one, bread. And wine for us grape juice. I don't talk about it a lot. Maybe I should talk about it more. But this is not my table. It's not this church's table. This church, this table where we serve communion, this is God's table. In the United Methodist Church, we invite all to come. We don't have criteria around that. And we invite you to come and receive what Jesus tells us was the bread of his body and the blood or the sacrifice, the cup. <coughs> Over my years of living and doing communion, which has been most of my life, well, I've been living a whole lot. <laughs> Some things, you, you wash your mouth at night, things just come out. <laughs> I watch people go to the ball game and they stand up and they do the the uh, national anthem and I see tears in people's eyes and that's rightfully so. Uh, we've got a wonderful country. And I hope the United States of America are long lasting and live forever. When we come to God's table, this is forever. When you come to this table today, 
all the saints, your mom, your dad, your grandparents, they're at the table already with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is our chance to come and be with them in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, it, it makes me have tears every time. So I hope you'll be here in a few when you're invited to come. To this place where heaven and earth meet right here in this little spot. And as you come up, maybe close your eyes and realize that we're here with all the saints. At a table that has unlimited seating. And we can remember those words that are on the screen. As we put our hands out to receive the bread and the grape juice. The greatest gift. The absolute most wonderful, incredible gift ever given on this planet or in all of eternity is the gift of Jesus Christ that will be given to you. Amen. As you're able, would you please stand? Take this opportunity, and don't move around too much, take this opportunity to offer signs of peace and reconciliation to each other here in the church. Peace, my friend. Two, Joe. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God. You are the creator of heaven and earth. You brought all things into being and called them good. From the dust of the earth, you formed us into your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. When rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, you bore up the ark on the waters, saved Noah and his family and made covenant with every living creature on the earth. When you led your people to Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights, you gave us your commandments and made with us your covenant people. When your people forsook your covenant, your private Elijah, prophet Elijah fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and on your holy mountain he heard your still small voice. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 holy Lord, 
God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ. When you gave him to save us, when you gave him to save us from our sin, your spirit led him into the wilderness. Where he fasted 40 days and 40 nights to prepare for his ministry. When he suffered and died on the cross for our sin, you raised him to life and presented him alive to the apostles, apostles during 40 days and exalted him at your right hand. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. Now when we, your people, prepare for the yearly feast of Easter, you lead us to repentance for sin and cleansing of our hearts, that during these 40 days of Lent we may be gifted and graced to reaffirm the covenant you made with us through Jesus Christ. Well, the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread. He gave thanks for the bread. He broke the bread. He gave it to his disciples. And said, take and eat, do this. Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts of Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ, Christ is died. died. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us, gathered here, and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to the whole world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast in his heavenly bank. Through your Son, Jesus Christ. With his Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. The church say, Amen. 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 Friends, today I'll be paring off, tearing off a little piece of bread and dipping it for you in the grape juice. And then if you'll hold your hands out like this when you come, I'll just put it into your hands. Uh, you are now invited to come. The table is prepared. Come to this place. for are having
We've been to the place where heaven and earth meet. We've been gifted. Let's celebrate what God has given us in the gift of Jesus Christ. Before I give the benediction or we sing our last hymn, which we're going to do both those in the other order, uh, I want to remind you we're collecting uh, backpacks, duffel bags, good, new, or good used shoes for CPS kids. Uh, they're going to be piled up over, I hope, in a big mountain over here in this corner. And uh, so Kathy and I particularly are going to get in the attic and look at some old suitcases we have that are still very usable. We're just not going to use them. And so uh, we're going to try to find stuff like that. So if you look around and you have things, let's uh, choose the same way. Look in your closet. I bet you there's some in the back you had not worn in a while. And uh, bring them down here. You know, you think, well, they're, they don't look too good. Well, let me just tell you, if you got none, anything is better. And they come in all sizes. They got some of these kids. Uh, I know Will Reed over it when he was at First Methodist had to go buy a belt for one of the kids. It was a CPS kid. And it was a size 47 or 48. So you think, well, these are kids. They Everything is what they need. They'll figure out how to use it if we give it to them. So I would remind you about that. That's the thing we can do here during Lent. It's a way to sacrifice. So clean out your closet. Bring it up here. Uh, there's going to be an offering in a week or two in the mission store of the stuff that didn't get bids uh, during the auction. It's going to be called a second chance opportunity. And I think it's going to, the, the people in charge have told me that any donation will work. Uh, so it'll be your opportunity to get a real bargain if you want one. Not that they weren't bargains already. Uh, anyway, that's that. If you'll stand now, let's sing together. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God, holy.
place today. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to the whole world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.